So what I want to talk about today a little bit, and I'm curious to hear your reaction, is the topic of Moshe Rabbeinu's request that there should be a leader that takes over for the Jewish people after he passes away. He's told in this week's parsha that he's not going to enter the land of Israel just like Aaron passed away in the desert. He's also going to pass away in the desert. And uh, basically, Moshe makes an appeal to God that there should be someone else to take over the leadership. Interesting as if Moshe assumes that there isn't going to be another leader after him. So that's the first section of, of Sukkim here. Parakhav Zayin, Pasuk Tezvav. Ayyadabir Moshe al Hashem Leimor. Rashi notes that usually we have Ayyadabir Hashem al Moshe Leimor. And now you have Ayyadabir Moshe al Hashem, which is actually rare. It only appears a few times in the Chumash. Yifkod Hashem lokeh ruchot l'chol basar ish al ha'ida. The Hashem should... God, here Hashem is described as elokeh ruchot which is interesting. He doesn't, you don't usually hear that term. Um, he should appoint somebody, right? Yifkod. Hashem should hire someone, appoint someone. Asher yetzei lefneim, vasher yavo lefneim, vasher yotziim, vasher yiviim. The person will go out before them, bring them back, etc. Velosiyeh adas Hashem katzon, asher in lahem roeh. Moshe is afraid they'll be like a flock of sheep that have no shepherd. Right? It's interesting that Moshe is worried that there isn't going to be a leader. Why would he think he, he was appointed to be the leader, so someone else would be appointed to be the leader after? Right, right. You would hope, right? It's inter- I saw a really nice idea. What does it mean, Asher Yetzei Lefnehem, Vasher Yavol Lefnehem, Vasher Yotzeim, Vasher Yeviyem? It seems redundant, right? Yotzeim, Yeviyem, twice. So it's interesting. The one approach that I saw was that a leader can inspire people in two different ways. He can inspire people just by the way he behaves individually, and he can also inspire people by encouraging them to do things directly. The leader can ask his his nation for to do things. Asher yitzay lefneim va'asher yavo lefneim is what we call the lechatchila, the ideal, right? The ideal situation is that the way in which the Jewish leader will behave will result naturally in everyone else behaving the same way. He's Yotzei Lefnehem, Yavol Lefnehem. He's not addressing them. He's just behaving. And however he behaves, that's it. But if that doesn't work, Yotzeim V'yivim. Then he should drag them along if that's what it takes. But that's the kind of person it should be. And they shouldn't be like a flock without a shepherd. So what's God's reaction? Right, you should do smicha on him, anoint, to anoint him. You should place him in front of a lazar, and you'll command him uh, in front of them. In other words, Moshe giving Yoshua his recommendation. You'll bestow from him from your own personal glory, so that the people will hear. He will stand in front of a lazar Kohen. And he'll go to the Urim Vitumim for advice. Again, the people will move based on his instructions. Everybody. And he did the smicha. Just like God instructed him. So... Do you think that God is happy with this request? Is this a proper request on the behalf of Moshe? Or is it an improper request? Uh, I had any request to show some mistrust is uh, in, improper. No. I, mean, it's not I, supposed I don't see it this way. I see it that he was caring about leaving the people. He didn't want to leave them like that. And he wanted to know what God thinks. So this is great. Two perfectly opposite perspectives, right? Yeah. A beautiful, that's what it takes to make a beautiful couple. There you go. <laughs> okay, so look at, skip to source two, and look at Rashi. By Daber Moshe Hashem, Moshe speaks up to God. Why is this telling, why is the Torah telling us this? Rashi first tells you that this is Moshe Rabbeinu being selfless. A great deed. Right? That's perspective number one. Rashi says, think about it. If you were the leader of the Jewish people and you were go- knew that you were going to be taken from this world, so you would want to spend time with your wife and you would want to spend time with your kids and you want to go on vacation. You want to see parts of the world. 
And what's Moshe Rabbeinu doing? He's petitioning so that the people will be protected. That's a selfless deed, and that's why the Torah spells out exactly this entire conversation, so that we will appreciate how dedicated Moshe was. Right, exactly. Now, Rashi, on just a second later, says the exact opposite, which unfortunately is not on the sheet. I apologize. You have to trust me, but you okay. can look it up after. Okay. On the next pasuk, on Yifkod Hashem, that God should appoint, Rashi says, and tell me how you react. Kevan Sheshama Moshe, Sheamar Lo Hamakom Tin Nachalat Tzlafchad Libno Tav. Right, the parsha of Tzlafchad's daughters was yes. right before this. Amar Higia Shaa Sheetvet Tzarchad. It's my turn to ask for the things that I want. Sheyirshu Banai Eskedulasi. That my children should take over my position. They never got it. No, it's not on there. It's not on the sheet. Not on the sheet. Rashi says here that why is this Parsha, this, why is this story following the story of Tzlafad's daughter's appeal for a piece of Nachal on Eretz Yisrael? The reason is because they came up and they said, we deserve more than we're getting, and they received it. And Moshe wants to argue that he is also entitled to something. And what is he entitled to? To make sure that his son is the leader of the Jewish people. And his son, nobody knows who that is. And it's not his son. It's Yoshua, his student. I think it's almost a contradiction. Yeah. Right? Moshe is this selfless individual worried about the people, and Moshe is worried about himself. So you mean that he wanted God to appoint one of his children? This was his meaning. He didn't want to say... He wasn't great. Right. right. So, Rabbi Mordechai Willig, I was reading an article that he published just today. I was looking at it. And he has a whole uh, suggestion. which answers a bunch of questions we're not going to get into in the story, where he argues that... What Moshe was, and what Moshe was looking for, was one individual to rule the people. At different points in Jewish history, you have political leaders and you have religious leaders. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Moshe is looking for that person. But Moshe recognizes that Yeshua is going to be the spiritual leader of the people. Mm -hmm. But he thinks that, he, that there's room for a political leader also. And maybe he's saying that his son should be the political leader, not at the expense of Yeshua. If you notice, by God tells him to um, to anoint the next leader, to do smicha, right? Yeah. And it says, yeah. One hand, even though normally smicha is with two hands. Oh. So Rabbi Willig's suggestion was that one hand was always destined for Yoshua, and the other hand was destined, Moshe thought was destined for somebody else. Not that it should both be for the same person. And it's interesting because one of the questions here, does God want a leader after Moshe? So part of this question might depend on how we view the notion of a king in general. Right? When the Jewish people look to, in Navi, they look for a king for the first time, the reactions are not so good. And the question is what the motivation of the people is. Why do they want a king? Do they want to be like the other nations of the world? Or are they actually looking for leadership? Uh, and what exactly Moshe's role was. When you have a leader like Moshe who fuses both the religious and, and the political into one, so that's a very positive thing to have. But not everyone necessarily can achieve that level. What about this son of Moshe mentioned anywhere else? Gershon. Well, Moshe has more than one son mentioned in the in the uh, yes. in the Chumash. I don't know Gershon. Gershon, Gershon and Allah are also. But that's the only one that uh, I know. Um, so yeah, the, the Torah mentions both. I love um, that. Yeah. And um, the Torah mentions both of them. It's interesting, it, it could be that Moshe's grandchildren are not the most religious of people. We have that tradition also. That Moshe's grandchildren worship Avodah Zarah, which might have something to do with Yisro. If you remember that Yisro, according to the Medrash, makes Moshe a deal that he can marry his daughter if he promises one of their children will worship Avodah Zarah. Oh, I didn't which, know that. that's, a, that's the Medrash's take. Now, some understand that that's not literal. But that then, is as if when you marry into that culture, there's bound to be some remnant. Yeah, but then remnant. Accepted God. Say that again? Yisro accepted God after that. Right, which is, so why was Yisro doing it? So I think in this year we talked about the possibility that Yisro believed the person should come to God on his own. God shouldn't be forced upon them. And maybe Yisro believed that there was value in his children and grandchildren witnessing, or having the option to explore the world and to see all of the religions just like he did. So whatever exactly that means. But most of his children are very much not involved in the, in the future of the Jewish people. And... Um, Despite that, Moshe is here appealing 
that they should be leaders to some extent, whether it means complete leadership or partial leadership, Moshe is appealing for them. So I was kind of looking at these two Rashis and thinking, so is Moshe doing the right thing? Is Moshe doing the wrong thing? Does God want there to be a leader or does he not? Um, that first statement is about the connection between the story of Slavchad's daughters and the story of Moshe asking for a new leader. This, what comes immediately after this? A whole series of karbonot. And the first karbon that the Torah talks about is the karbon tamid. And what the Sifri in source number three wonders about is what the connection is between the two. If you look at the Psukim first, go back to source one, Pinchas Perk Chavchas. By the Abir Hashem Moshe Leimor, Tzavis Bnei Yisrael V'Yamartal Lehem. Command the Jewish people and tell them, as Karbani Lachmi Liisha. Karbani is my, my carbon, my offering. Lachmi is my food, Liishai, of my fires, my ish, right? Reach Ni Cholchi. A pleasure, uh, a pleasing aroma. Tishmerula hakrivli b'mado. Make sure to uh, to offer it at the proper time. The amartala and you should tell the people. Zeha yishea asher takriu l'Hashem. This is the offering that you should give to God. Kvasim b'nei shana simimim. Shnayim layo mala samit. Kvasim b'nei shana means uh, lambs that are young, right, of, of one year old. Timimim, that they're complete, they have no blemish. Shnaim layom, two every day. Tamid, constantly. As akeves echad taseva bokir, one lamb should be brought in the morning. As akeves hasheni taseva in harbayim. The second one should be brought in the evening. When we talk about the the uh, prayers every day, and where we get the idea of prayer from. So the Talmud is one suggestion that we get that from the forefathers, that there were Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And the other possibility was that it's related to the Karbanos. And the first Karban is the Karban Talmud in the morning, that would be Shachris. And the second Karban is the Karban being Harabai, and that would be Mincha. That's what we call the Karban Talmud, which gets its name, Tamid, from the fact that it's a consistent Karban. One every morning and one every night. I have a question. Sure. They were in the desert with no food, eating man, complaining they have no meat. Where do animals come from? They definitely had. And that's part of the question. Did they actually not have any meat to eat? Or maybe they just were worried that because they were bringing all of these sacrifices that they wouldn't have enough left. They definitely brought plenty of cattle with them. They complain that there isn't food. When they complain there's no food, they complain there's no food for their cattle. Yeah. Right, remember? There's no food for our families and there's no food for our animals. Yeah, but they say in Egypt we have this kind of yeah, stuff. right. It's true. It's interesting, though. <coughs> right, there probably were no fish in the desert. That's for sure. So, what does this what does this carbon have to do with the parsha before it? So, look at the sifri. The sifri is the medrash, right? One of the midrashim. Lahakriv li b'moado. You should bring the carbon at its proper time. Lama nemar. Why is this being spoken about now? Because we just talked about that's a reference to the previous story. Here's the mashal. A king whose wife was going to pass away. And she was instructing her husband on how he should behave with their children. Amralo, bivakashanimcha, hizarli bibanai. So what does she say to him before she passes away? Make sure to take care of the kids, right? Amar la, acha mifakteni al banai, paktani es banai alai. What's the husband's response? The husband says back to his wife, all you do is tell me how I should treat the kids. Always forgive the kids, don't get mad at the kids. That's what the husband, the wife always says to the husband. How come you never tell the kids that they should treat me respectfully? <laughs> They shouldn't rebel. They shouldn't disrespect me. So too, this was God's response to Moshe. The people shouldn't disrespect me and they shouldn't go behind my back and worship other gods. Yeah. Why are you coming? Now, just to finish it up. Therefore, God says, rather than talk to me, give the people a mitzvah. Give them the carbon tamid. And that's a connection between these stories. And Moshe goes to God for a new leader. 
And God said, you shouldn't be using your last days to talk to me. You should be talking to the people and giving them a karma. So I read this for the first time just a few days ago. Now here's what, here's what jumped out at me right away. First of all, what is Moshe's job? If you were to write Moshe's job description down, what would you include? Leader. Right. What, what does he do? He's the connection between the people and God. The Would it be fair to say that Moshe is a mediator? Mediator, yes. It's interesting. I think Moshe's job is much more than the guy who goes to God to apologize every time the Jews make up, make a mistake. Yeah, but it looks like he's, he translates what God cannot speak straight to the people. So that's not what this is talking about. He, he says, why are you coming to me? You're worried about who's going to apologize on behalf of the people. Tell the people not to make mistakes. The implication is that if the people weren't making mistakes, if they didn't need somebody to go to Har Sinai and apologize, then they wouldn't need Moshe at all. But Moshe also transmits from God. Moshe also gives them spiritual advice. Moshe always leads them in the, de in the desert. He does a lot of things. Moshe leads them in war, right? And what's Moshe's job here? It says, well, if I'm not going to be around, someone else needs to be able to convince God to forgive me. So first of all, I thought that that was a kind of an interesting take on a very limited description of what Moshe does. That's first of all. Second of all, I think, what do you see here? That God is not so excited about Moshe's request. Right? Does God think this is a good idea that Moshe is asking for a new leader? Is this Moshe being selfless? Maybe. But God says, you have your priorities wrong. Right? God says to Moshe, you're coming to me to make sure that there will be someone who I respect, whose opinion will matter, that when it comes time to pray, I will take them seriously. And God says, you shouldn't be talking to me. You should be straightening the people out so they don't keep making the same mistakes. And the final question I have for you is, why Karpan Tamid? Okay, so the Jewish people have haven't quite worked out all the kinks in the system. And they're not exactly sure that they're going to be able to do it without a leader. So what should Moshe do? Moshe should instruct them that they should bring a carbon every morning and a carbon every night. And that'll solve the problem? What, what does that mean? What's this all about? Any thoughts? Just... Uh, reminder. The reminder. Right, the, the carbon, carbon is a reminder. reminder. Right, a reminder of what exactly? Whatever you're supposed to do and think about. This Sifri specifically is addressing Avodazara, right? Idolatry. So, is this a reminder of idolatry? It's to take them away from idolatry. To give them something to do which is not idolatry. So this is very good, very, very good. So first of all, the carbon Tamid is always referred to as the model of consistency. Kevis Echa Taseva Boka is a Kevis Asheni Tasebe in Harbayim. Carbon Tamid is the model for a Jew always being consistent. And prayer is also consistent, and to a certain extent we, we get that from um, we get that from the carbon Tamid. We it's patterned after the Karbanos. But I wanted to tell you that the Torah Tzmimah has an unbelievable insight here about the Karban Tamid and why it addresses this specific need for the Jewish people. The source for the Gemara in Tamid picks up on the Pasuk that says Shnayim Layom. Before we look at the source, what does Layom mean? Shnayim Layom. How would you translate that? Two per day. Two per day. Okay. So the Gemara, maybe it's really concerned to this, maybe not, asks how to translate that expression, what the Lamed is doing in Shnaim Layom. Amr Chizda, Amr Akras, Shnaim Layom. What does that mean? Kineged Hayom. Kineged means opposite. Tanya Nami Hafi, Shnaim Layom, Kineged Hayom. Twice against the day. Ata Omer, Neged Hayom, does it mean against, opposite the day? Oin Wel Chovas Hayom two per day, the obligations of the day. You're obligated to bring one in the morning, one at night. Kishihu Omer, Sakevis Echad Taseva Bokir, Sakevis Ashinita Sebe, in Harbayim, Hare Chovat Hayom Amor. 
What's the point? The Torah tells us you bring one by day and one by night. So why does it say Shnayim Layum? It already told us. It's a Kevis Echata Sevo, Kevis Kevis Hashinit Hasevi and Harbayim. So I know there are two. And it says Shnayim Layum. So it can't mean two per day, because that's obvious. So it must mean, Shnayim Layom must mean two opposite the day. Hamani Mekayim Shnayim Layom Neged Hayom. Hakitzad. So what does that mean? How is this possible? Tamin Shal Shachar Hayan Ishchad Al Keren Sifonit Maravid Al Tabach The carbon Tamid in the morning was brought on the northwest corner of the, of the Mizbeah. Vishel bein harabayim and the carbon tamid of the evening, nishchat al karen svonis misrafis is brought on the north east side of the mizbeach al tavashenia. Where does the sun rise every morning? East. Where does the sun set? West. In the west. Where is the carbon tamid shal shachar brought? Which position? In the morning, the carbon is brought. Marat is the is is the west. Right, in, in in the northwest. And at night it's brought in the northeast. The opposite of where the sun rises and the sun sets. So there are a couple of different ways to look at what this means, what the significance of this is. But the Torah to me must suggest the following. It was known at the time that the Jewish people were living in the desert that they were competing with religions that sacrificed to the sun when it rose in the morning and when it set at night. And we saw in the Sifri the concern that Moshe Rabbeinu has is the concern that they're going to be idolaters. So what did they do? They instituted a carbon that is specifically intended to remind the people to do the opposite of the idolaters that they lived around at the same time. So the carbon tamid is brought in the west in the morning and in the east in the evening so that it's the exact opposite of... Um, of what they, they were doing. It's interesting that in the laws of, of Beit HaKnesset, in the laws of shuls, we find that you're not supposed to build a shul so that the sun will rise, will shine into the windows of the shul when you're davening in the morning. Because what will it look like? So what, what, what are we afraid of? But it also depends when it'll rise. Pray to the sun. Right, we're afraid that people are going to pray to the sun and we try to make sure that it doesn't look that way. Because we're afraid of it. There's also discussion when we do Kiddush Levana to bless the new moon. You don't want to be davening to the moon. Today it's not actual anymore. It's not? It's, today it's not relevant anymore. Why not? Oh, right. Well, okay, right, that's, the right, it's, it's interesting. So, first of all, that answers our question. Why specifically the carbon tummy? But what I thought was very interesting about this is a few months ago we had a discussion about the opinion of the Rambam about Karbanos. In the beginning of Sefer Vayikra, when we start the discussion of what all the Karbanos are, so there's a big machlokis between the Rambam and, uh, and the Ramban, but really others also, about why we have Karbanot at all. And the Rambam, in the, you know, the Moran of Uchim is the Rambam's uh, guide to the perplexed, right? It was the Rambam's philosophic work about Judaism, which was very controversial at the time. There are a lot of points in the Rambam which people wonder, the historians wonder, if he felt that they were the truth 100%, or that was the way he presented religion, the Jewish religion, to the public. It was maybe easier to digest than saying things a certain way. So he gives very rational explanations for things that others understood to be spiritually and Kabbalistically significant. And they were very concerned about the way that the Rambam phrased those uh, rational explanations of mitzvot. Didn't the Rambam say that it's not the third Beit Hamikdash is not going to have Korban? So he yeah, right. So there's discussion. In some places he says one thing, some places he says another thing. Uh, Rav Kook, who was the chief rabbi of Israel, so he supported the view that there wouldn't be there, wouldn't there would not be animal sacrifice. No. There would be sacrifice from grain, oh. which yeah. they had in the temple it's also. The exactly. So. What, were, what did the Rambam say about Karbanos? Why does the Rambam say you have Karbanos? So the Rambam gives two different, similar but different approaches. One approach of the Rambam is you can't, you can take the Jew out of Egypt, but you can't take Egypt out of the Jew. That the Jew of Mitzrayim grows up in a uh, polytheistic world, in an idolatrous world, and you can't expect them to transition from that 
to the Judaism that you and I know today. And now that was always to me is a very uh, F, acute point. And the reason I say that is because we think of religion as praying and studying and all these things, but at that time for sure, no one believed it was religion if it didn't cost. No one believed it was religion if you weren't doing anything, if you weren't worshiping physically. So does God need our carbono, said the Rambam? Absolutely not. God doesn't need carbon, yeah. like he doesn't need anything else. Yeah. But we need the carbon. Yeah. And why do we need it? Because if you tell me that my religion is learning Torah and dominating three times a day, I wouldn't be able to handle that. Yeah. Now that leads to the, uh, the, 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 the possibility that maybe one day we won't need carbonos anymore, like yeah. you were saying, right? It, lead, yeah. it follows yeah. from that point. So there, there the Rambam says, you, when the Jew leaves Mitzrayim, when the Jew lives in that kind of culture, he needs to have this as part of his worship. The alternative that the Rambam gives, which is a similar point, is very similar to this, uh, this approach to the Gemara here. The Rambam says that rather than just tell us the Goyim have a different way of worshiping their gods, we slaughter their gods. Because yeah. at that time, they worshipped animals. Yeah, and we know that from the Pesach mm-hmm. story, right? When they were taking the sheep, they were the afraid sheep, that yeah. if they take the sheep, it's going to risk their lives. Yeah. And that was one of the risks the Jewish people had to take. That's why Karim Pesach was so important. Because yeah. it really was a very dangerous move. Even though we know that God was intending to protect them. But they didn't know that. At least they, 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 they had to take that chance. And show their faith. So what were they doing? They were taking the Avodah of other religions. And they were slaughtering it to God. In other words, the... To, this, show, to show the Jews that their gods are not the Right, Lord. which shows something to God and shows it to us as well. The Ramban was very upset about this. Uh, Nachmanides, among others. And what was his problem with it? Think about all of the symbolism in sacrifice. It's not as, e- it's not as simple as just killing an animal. There's an entire process, and there's a smicha, and we have a a formulation where we say, I, I see myself as if I'm the one that's being sacrificed, but I'm sacrificing the animal instead, right? And there, there, there's all these things that go into it, all these halachos of the sanctity of the animal when you donate it to the temple. Mm-hmm. And the Ramam said, all oh, why? So that we can show the other religions that their religions are silly. It downplays the va- all the other values that are brought up in the notion of sacrifice because he oversimplified it. Yeah. And he said the only reason we need it is because of this or that. These very, very basic, if you will, ideas that the, the, it's beneficial for us to see carbonos, either because it downplays the significance of other religions or it's beneficial for us to have a concrete way to worship God, but it's not an ideal way to worship God. The Ramban said, of course it's an ideal way to worship God. It's an entire book of the Chumash. You're talking about 20% of the Chumash is donated to sacrifice, and you've just dismissed the whole thing as being necessary for the Jews of that time. And the Ramban would definitely be in the camp that says, of course the sacrifice is going to be come back at the time of the Third Temple. How could it not? It's such a central part of what we do. Especially if you want to say, like we've been talking about all along tonight, that the, that the prayers that we have are patterned after Karbanos. So it's the only reason we pray is because we don't have Karbanos. And if we can have the Karbanos back, we wouldn't need the prayers. Yeah. Yom Kippur is all about, you know, at least back in the times of the Beis this is all about sacrifice. So that's it? All, all for that simple reason that the Ram gives? It can't be. So. I immediately thought of this debate between the Rambam and the Ramban when I read this Gemara. The Karban Tamid is what? It's exactly like the Pesach story. I thought it was really interesting. It, you could read this Gemara to be saying that we bring the Karban Tamid to remind us that the other religions are silly. <coughs> now, that again might be an oversimplification, and there are other values of the Karban Tamid, the values of consistency, like we mentioned. So it's hard to really limit it to that, but it really does remind me of this Rambam. And that's why I wanted to bring it up. Um, last week we talked about Moshe hitting the well, hitting the rock, and how that was the reason that he didn't enter the land of Israel. And we mentioned the approach of the Nativ, that Moshe wasn't supposed to hit the rock. And the reason that Moshe, if you remember, the reason Moshe brought his staff, remember God said to him, take your staff with you. So why is God telling him to take his staff if he's not supposed to hit the rock? So the Nitzv's suggestion was that 
in the process of bringing the Jewish people into the land of Israel, God needed to start giving them their independence, not depending on miracles as much as they used to. And the way he wanted to do that is to show them that their prayers had tremendous weight and power. And when Moshe would come with his staff, he wasn't coming to use the staff. He was theoretically supposed to show the people that this staff that performed all those miracles for you in the past, its usage is coming to an end. It's going to be your time to... But Moshe lived a miraculous desert lifestyle. And he was focused on that miracle. And the way the Nitziv described it, the way we formulated the Nitziv, was that it was a lost opportunity for Kiddush Hashem. It was a lost opportunity for the Jewish people to to be taught how powerful their prayers could be. And it wasn't necessarily a conscious mistake of Moshe, but it was, it, it was representative of the fact that Moshe had a different kind of reality. Moshe was a spiritual person more than other people. He spent 40 days, however we understand it, face to face with God on Har Sinai, preparing to bring, down the, to bring down the Torah. And Moshe was not, in a certain sense, the perfect leader for the lifestyle in Israel. Right? Why did the spies say all those bad things about Eretz Yisrael? A lot of the commentators suggest because they were afraid to go from the spiritual life in the desert where everything that they need is provided to them, pro- provided for them by God, and to go into a land where they had to work for themselves. They were afraid that the physical existence would detract from their spiritual relationship with God. And Moshe was the best example of this extreme spiritual relationship in the desert. He was a very spiritual man. And that was what the Nitziv was driving at, that maybe Moshe wasn't the right person for the job, at least when it came to life in Eretz Yisrael. Could be maybe Moshe's request of God was that I shouldn't be allowed in as a leader, but I should be allowed in as a regular person because he wanted to be in Eretz Yisrael. But he, was not, he did not marry in, in, in Goa. So at the time, we also mentioned that Yeshua is very different. And there are things that, qualities that Yeshua has that Moshe doesn't when he takes over the people. Uh, the Gemara compares Moshe and Yeshua to the sun and the moon. Yeah. That Moshe is the source of light, and the moon just reflects. Uh, Yeshua just reflects the the light, like the moon reflected the light, etc., uh, etc. Et so it's interesting in this context to understand why God wants Yeshua to take over for the people, because He doesn't want the people's way of life to be that they have issues, they have confusion about religions of the other world and understanding God, and they go to Moshe. He's starting, like the Nitziv said, to give the people independence. And maybe that's another message that the Sifri is driving at. That Moshe goes to God and he says, who's going to guide them? Who's going to defend these people and inspire these people? And what's what's God's answer? It's time for the people to start inspiring themselves. And how do we do that? The carbon tummy, the model of consistency. That they're supposed to do things every single day that remind them that the Avodah of the world are not for them. Yeah. And that's the leadership that Yeshua is supposed to play. He's not as dominant of a spiritual leader as Moshe was. He's a, maybe a second hand, second rate to Moshe. That's the comparison of the sun versus the moon. Yeshua's job is to guide them and convince them and to inspire them to do things on their own. Yeshua is going to be the one who's not going to perform as many miracles. He's going to encourage the people to have to hold themselves to the standard that God wants and to pray to God for the things that they need. Yeshua himself, the Navi, always describes as being Chazak Ve'amatz. Everyone gives him this blessing that he should be strong because he has a very difficult challenge. But he's not supposed to take all of the load that Moshe Rabbeinu did. And here we see the beginnings of that transition like we did last week. That Moshe is telling God, I want to make sure that there's someone who can do what I'm doing, and God doesn't want that anymore. That was true in the Midbar. That was true in the desert life of the Jews that were there for 40 years, but that wasn't going to be true anymore. The Jew, in Eretz Yisrael, the Jews spread, up, spread out. They don't see Yushalayim all the time. They only come in a few times a year. They live a very physical existence. They live an existence where they're dependent on rain instead of a well, which requires them to daven for rain and to look to heaven. And they're also responsible to fight the challenge of Avodah Zarah that faces them in, in the land of Israel, but they're supposed to learn to fight it on their own. And maybe Carbon Tumid is one of the ways that they were able to do it. And they get separate. Right, that goes back to the story with Slavkai. They didn't even marry. 
so there are different points when they did and different points when they didn't. The, the concern was always that the land was divided according to the males in the family. Yeah. But if there were no males left in the family, the females inherit the land. And they marry somebody from a different tribe, and it shifts. Now, the farther you go along in history, the less significant that is, because one person's property is not so big. But understand that there weren't so many people, relatively, that went into the land of Israel at the beginning. So you have a family of how many male heads of family. I don't know how many it was, but not so many. And they divide up a huge portion, you know, one eleventh of, of the land of Israel, or one twelfth of the land of Israel. And then one person from that family marries into another family, which was a concern with Tlachad's daughters. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you have a major shift. It's interesting that in the book of Yoshua, what, there are two complaints. The Gemara says there are only two complaints that Yeshua received about the division of the land. And those two complaints were the daughters of Slavchad and the tribe of, of, of Yosef. That the people of Yosef, we yeah. spoke about this when we talked about Ayin Hara, yeah. right? That the tribe of Yosef, they yeah. came to Yeshua and they said, we have so many people yeah. and our equal portion in the land is not sufficient. So there was a major concern that with a shift through marriage, that a woman that would inherit land would shift in one direction and all of a sudden the balance one, yeah, would, be thrown, would be thrown off. That's definitely, that's definitely true, but as a general rule, there wasn't a problem of, of intermarriage. The other exception was when there were certain stories in Shoftim where there was a disconnect between the people because of sins that some had done and they separated from each other for certain periods of time. It's considered a great tragedy that for even in the times of the Talmud, that, uh, Rabbis from the from Babylonia weren't interested in marrying into the families in Israel because they were concerned about proper lineage. People had intermarried with other religions, conversions that weren't done properly, which is something that we face today. I think they didn't even relay on the calendar from the came from Israel at one time. Well, that's because everything was done according to according to seeing the moon. Yeah. So there was, that was also a question, just practically, how do you get from one place to the other? How do you transmit that information fast enough? That's where the whole notion of keeping two days of a Chag comes from, yeah. right? It comes from there. So things become very, very different in the land of Israel. And that's not just true politically and socially, but it's true religiously also. And the transition from Moshe to Yoshua is more than just about who's going to take over next, but the fact that the leadership of the Jewish people is going to be very different than it used to be. Yeshua has a different job. The people have more independence in their religion after Moshe passes away. And the Karban Talmud is one of the mitzvot that is, that is directed at that transition to help the people, yeah. to help the people survive.